Hi, thank you for watching Podiatry Practice Mastery. I appreciate you showing interest in these videos and they're coming out weekly and uh, I hope you have uh, interest in them. Underneath this video, you're gonna find some other resources based on the topics we've, we've addressed. Uh, also, we're putting together some group sessions you might be interested in. If you want to have more information of kind of developing and being part of a podiatry community where we talk about practice management ideas, I'd love for you to join us at the next one. The information is underneath this video. Thank you so much. Hello and welcome to Healthy Living. I'm Dr. Donald Pelto and today we have Cindy Peza. She's from Pinnacle Practice Achievement and she's a practice management coach for podiatrists. So welcome to the show. Thank you. So Cindy, we've been friends for a while, and uh, I, I want to start out just by asking you kind of what you're excited about right now in the podiatry realm and how you're providing great uh, benefit to the podiatrists. Um, well, I'm super excited that I get to do what I've always done and basically work virtually, which means that I only have to ever get dressed from, from the waist up and can wear my yoga pants every day. Um, no, I'm really excited because um, the pandemic, although a pandemic is a pandemic, right? And it was nothing we were, could have ever prepared for. Um, you know, in, in March, I was very worried because as, as a practice management consultant and coach, um, as practices, some were closing their doors, others were seeing very few patients a day. I thought I'm going to be out of a job, right? Because mm -hmm. if no one's open, no one needs me. So I took it as an opportunity to work with doctors everywhere, no matter what stage of practice they were in, and had them really start digging, really start looking at the aspects of their practice that they never had time to before. Mm -hmm. Because there was always the excuse of, well, yeah, I'd like you to work with me, but I have to clean some things up. And that to me is like cleaning before the cleaning lady gets there. You know, you want to put everything away so she doesn't really see how you live. But they started looking at really what they did not like about their practices, maybe how their practices had shifted over the years and kind of the initial goal or type of practice they were building, it never happened and it kind mm -hmm. of spiraled out of control. So I used, you know, the opportunity between March and, and still now to give content. And a lot of times it was just free content, things that I wrote for PM News or a whole series of articles. Uh, E-blasts I was sending sometimes two and three times a day uh, as, you know, the triple P loans and the EDIL grants and all mm -hmm. that information was changing so quickly. And I really did, um, you know, it's that whole marketing thing of you have to get in front of someone at least seven times before they yeah. understand yeah. who you are and what you do. It, it, it was very true. It just, I never took that into consideration for me. So what I'm excited about is the fact that so many podiatrists have used the four slowdown to find the silver linings in all of this. And now we're really buckling down and figuring out how are we going to make things better? You know, whether it's staff turnover, some practices had to completely uh, get a new staff because they realized some of their employees just weren't in it, you know, for the big picture. It was just about them. Um, and others, it was what type of practice do they want to recreate? You know, it's, mm -hmm. are, you, are you cutting toenails all day long because you can't fit anyone else on your schedule? It's too full. And how do we rectify that? How do we change it? Are you looking at maybe shifting towards more of a cash model rather than relying on reimbursement? That's unreliable. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity here. It's kind of like the pandemic provided a clean slate. So we can start over. Start over. Right, right. Let's, uh, I'm seeing a little, I don't know if you're hearing, uh, I was hearing an echo there. Uh, so let's, let's talk a little bit about, let's say there's some young doctors that are just starting out and uh, maybe they would be good for you to work with. Maybe they just want to try it on their own. Let's give some real great uh, advice. And uh, you gave me some uh, ideas before here. What are, what is something that a young doctor or a doctor starting out uh, can do best? Let's talk about maybe the top three things that give the greatest bang for their time. So the first would be, and I get calls um, probably three or four a week from doctors that are finishing residency or maybe work for someone for a while, want to go out on their own. They're just not really content with their current situation. I would say first and foremost is location. You know, they say location is everything. They're not just talking about real estate. I mean, in terms of where do you want to live? What kind of lifestyle do you want? Where do you want to become a part of the community that you practice in? Because you want to be able to run into your patients at the grocery store, you know, mm -hmm. with your mask on and you're kind of unrecognizable now, but 
you want to be a part of that community. You want to be able to go and support, you know, local high school, you know, sports teams and, and really be that local community doctor that everyone thinks about whenever they have a foot or ankle issue. So that's the first and foremost thing. Second part of that is considering if you have a spouse, if you have a partner, yep. where do they want to live? Because the happy wife, happy husband, happy life thing, that's, that's really important. You know, if you say, well, it doesn't matter to me, I'll practice anywhere, and an opportunity comes up in Kansas in the middle of nowhere, mm -hmm. and your spouse is, say, from Los Angeles, I don't think she's going to be too happy living in the middle of Kansas. Maybe she will be, but yeah. chances are not. And the third thing is if you're joining a practice or if you're starting your own, figure out what your niche is. What, what's your specialty within a specialty that you're super excited about? I mean, I haven't heard too many, you know, younger podiatrists that said, I'm super excited about debriding nails and calluses. I just can't wait to do that every day. Figure out what you want. Do you want to see a lot of kids? Do you want to specialize in rear foot correction? Like what mm -hmm. drives you and, and makes you want to go to work every day? So wow. those, are, those are my three. I like that. Now let's talk about a more, a more seasoned uh, professional that's been working in their kind of in a glut, one thing you mentioned is, is see how much time you're spending on nails or routine care or even how, how to incorporate new things. What are, the, what are the real stellar practices and podiatrists doing that just the other ones aren't doing? What is the main difference between, let's say, a really one that's going 10x and the one, one that isn't? And we could even, let's keep it simple, just a single doctor or two doctor practice. We're not talking about have 10 practices, but the ones that are really doing great. Okay. I would say uh, two main things. Well, let's, let's, stick with threes okay the first thing is um they are thinking quality over quantity so whenever i hear doctors well i have four locations and there's there's only two of us but we spread between the four locations and we do half a week here and, and they're an hour apart and none of those locations are managed very well or are maximized so that's first and foremost and even in terms of quality over quantity not cramming in 45 patients a day into your schedule because you think that's what you have to do to make money. It's maximizing each individual encounter and looking at every patient that walks in your door as an opportunity to educate them on what more you can do for them. No one knows what podiatrists do. The podiatrists is like the joke in, in television shows and movies. You know, remember that old Seinfeld episode where Elaine was dating, dating a podiatrist and, you know, he wasn't a real doctor to them until one of them had a foot problem and then he was a real doctor. So it's educating every patient that walks in because it could be just nails. It could be just calluses, whatever it is, but maybe you're sitting and looking at them in the chair and they have bilateral PT tendon dysfunction that no one's ever discussed with them before, that there are things you can do which moves me to number two, which would be ancillary services, the above and beyond, the providing everything under one roof, the convenience of it, you know, sometimes the cost savings of it. You can't think in terms of, well, my patients can't afford that or my patients wouldn't go for that because that's probably not an ancillary service that you yourself believe in. So what I mean is, you know, if you have a laser that you bought 10 years ago and it sits in the back of the office, kind of like a used car, it's because you don't believe that it works. Because if I you agree. believe that it works, right, you, you would be offering it more and more patients would be taking you up on it. They would be seeing positive results. And then your staff would see, look, people actually get better when we use a laser. Shockwave, same thing. If you have a shockwave and you're waiting until visit three of a heel pain patient that's just not getting better because they're either being non-compliant or they're just not getting better, to introduce it, the patient's gonna think, well, why didn't you tell me about that on the first visit? Mm -hmm. Because I have a high deductible, high co-pays, co-insurance. It's costing me more out of pocket than it would be to pay for a cash service. So that kind of ties all in together. And three, looking at your schedule and thinking, what is my practice turned into? Because I didn't control the marketing. If mm -hmm. by year 10, you haven't controlled the patients that you market to and who you want to bring in, what types of patients do you want to see, what kind of conditions, even what kind of payers you want to treat, you're going to have a hard time managing that. It's not impossible, but it's very difficult to kind of rework that schedule when it's jam packed with routine foot care and some not some great payers. Yeah, I think those are great. I think we can even delve more in into these. So when we're talking about quality uh, over quantity of patients, mm -hmm. 
are you meaning, because all, all patients are, we all see the same. If you're in Massachusetts, if you're in Florida, if you're in California, a patient is a patient. But what you're talking about in terms of quality is being able to provide more services for them. So what are some good tips that work for doctors so that they can provide more more services for the patient? Is it they, they have to be creative? Is there other things that, what are some things that, let's just go through some of these. It's not even creative because then it's like we're, we're creating maybe diagnoses that don't exist or we're, we're offering things that eh, it's really not appropriate. I'm talking about looking at every patient and starting from the initial phone call of the reason for visit, why they need to be seen, triaging them according to medical necessity as well as practice impact. What I mean is mm-hmm. a patient that has had heel pain for six months but decided this morning they have the day off of work and it's, it's so annoying. They want to be seen right away. Train your staff to get that patient in because otherwise if you don't train the staff on the practice impact of that patient, they're going to push them off in the schedule two weeks, three weeks. And then what's going to happen, they'll call around until they find someone else to treat them. Then go through and train your staff that's evaluating patients. Train them how to watch the patient walk back from the treatment room. See if their, their gait is steady or not. See if they're holding mm-hmm. onto the wall, if they have balance issues. Look at their ankles, see if their feet are rolling in mm-hmm. without diagnosing because they're not doctors. Mm-hmm. So they can tell you when the patient comes in and is positioned comfortably in the chair that this patient is here for routine foot care, but I don't know, you might want to look at her ankles because doctors get in the room, they are just tunnel vision, just only the problem that's right in front of them. I've been in rooms with doctors before where there's been a patient, a diabetic patient not seen in a while, which is you know our fault for not making sure the patient understands how important it is to check your feet every day, stay regular with your podiatrist. For a splinter, the patient comes in, thinks they have a splinter. Well, they also have like some severe ankle deformity and general foot pain every day, something that they could be either put in a custom orthotic or a custom brace, something we could do easily for them, but they don't even think about it. So training your staff to be your eyes and your ears is super important with offering more. Because when I worked in a practice every day and I evaluated patients every day, I definitely was collecting, you know, the NL DOCAT, major location Mm -hmm. duration of the reason for a visit. But I was also looking at what else can we do for you that you don't even know we can do for you. Even rolling up pant legs up to the knees. Look at the whole lower leg. Look at the ankle. Look at the foot. Don't just look at the ingrown toenail in front of you or or only the alleged wart or whatever it is. I think those those are great. And and so I think maybe a better word would be being more comprehensive. I I, I think a lot of times we just kind of look at that one thing that we have them there and you don't kind of, and I, you know, I think you were right. What you said before, it could it be maybe because they only have 10 minutes or 15 minutes. You, you don't have, you don't have enough time to breathe. Right. It could be that, but it's something that this patient has lived with for a long time. And we want to follow up about that. Maybe not during today's visit. Maybe we talk a little bit about it, but look, if you're, if you're cutting someone's toenails, sorry, debriding, we never say cut or trim, right? If you're debriding someone's toenails, what are you going to talk about? The same thing that you've talked about for the last 10 years, or now you're going to talk about the pandemic, how crazy it is and how it's terrible to wear a mask everywhere. I mean, take that conversation somewhere else and educate the patient and put the idea in their head because they don't know that you do that. Whatever they're appointed to see you because of, whatever their reason for visit, that's it. To the patient, that's all you treat. So you might just be the fungal nail doctor. You might be the wart doctor. You might be the ingrown doctor, but that's it. So educating them and letting them know, start talking about, you know, do you ever have ankle pain? Do you notice that your shoes wear out quickly? And then for the follow-up reason for visit, okay, we're going to follow up about whatever the patient was there today for, but we're also going to talk about ankle problems. Now, any way to, let's say someone is just kind of really busy and uh, they, they could think of that. Are there any ways that your doctors that you're helping are able to automate that? Maybe with a, a newsletter, or do you think that works or campaigns or, or things like that? Some more sophisticated technology. Sure. Our pay, some people print them, some people email them. Mm-hmm. I mean, so, you know, email e-blast obviously is the more cost-effective way to go and, and you're reaching a, a, you know, a wider um, kind of net of mm-hmm. patients, but it is, it's how you do it. It's, you don't, patients don't care about you per se. I mean, they like you, they think you're a great guy, a great doctor, but 
they don't really care about you and all your diplomas on the wall. They care about themselves. Yeah, everyone just cares about themselves. And what can you do to help me? So you want to present in a way that's purely educational. When I was sending out a million e-blasts, I felt like I was inundating doctors with information, but they needed it during that time to get us through the pandemic and all of the regulation changes. It was nothing about me, that I'm a great consultant, hire me, I can help you. It was about, this is what you need to know. You may not know it, I'm, I'm just purely providing information, and that's it. So it's the way that you present it. And it's no different than presenting you know, different case types to your referring providers, because they also get stuck in a rut of only sending you certain patients. Only refer to diabetics or someone else sure. to you. Yep. Yeah. I, I Another thing that you said I really liked were in terms of the, the ancillary services. I think, and you said a lot of times people don't do it because they don't believe it. So a, f- a few of those might be uh, laser treatment for fungal nails. Um, I'll say one personally, I hope no one's listening, but epidermal f- nerve fiber biopsies like certain things that people talk about, but if, if it doesn't really change how you're treating. Um, other, otherwise, though, I think a lot of times people don't use ancillary because they don't understand them. They don't maybe, under, you know, someone, they bought it because someone said it was a good idea, but they, if you don't understand the reason for doing it, so I think a lot of it's a lack of understanding. And it's also, again, like we talked about before we started recording about not comparing yourself too much to your competitors or other people in your profession you can use certain things as industry standards of, you know, purpose and value averages. But when it comes to ancillary services, it has to meet, it has to fit with your practice. You know, if you're in an area that you know patients can't afford or or won't pay for something, then you're probably right to some extent. No matter what, if it's a product or a service you believe in, there's, it's not going to be hard to convince patients because patients trust you. They, they really do respect you as a foot and ankle specialist. Mm-hmm. So like orthotics are a perfect example. If you have three doctors in a practice and we run reports at the end of the month and one doctor dispenses 40 pairs of orthotics a month and one does 27 pairs and the other does three. I look at their patient volume. It's all about the same. I look at their new patients, how they're divided up, all about the same. Looking at the conditions they're treating, all about the same. You're all treating a lot of foot pain, heel pain, arch pain, ankle pain. And I'll say to the one doctor who dispensed three pairs, can I see your orthotics? Can you take them out of your shoes? And we'll be just talking like this. And they'll say, I don't wear orthotics. And I'll say to the other two doctors, can you show me your orthotics? And they'll take them out of their shoes. Yeah, they wear them, they believe believe in them. Of -hmm. course. Same thing with outfitting your staff with orthotics, even a medical grade that you carry. Mm -hmm. Have the staff take them out of their shoes because patients relate to staff members. So I always use this analogy. Doctors to, in the eyes of a patient, you're not a real person. Like I know, Don, you're a real person, Mm -hmm. right? right? You eat food, like you breathe, you're a real person. But to a patient, it's sort of like when you're in third grade and you're out at the grocery store, and you see your teacher, They're not and a you real person. pull your mother like, oh, it's Mrs. Anderson, she's here, she's buying food. Because when you're little, you think your teacher lives at school, they, they don't eat food or they just eat out of the cafeteria, right? So that's the same kind of thing. But to a patient, a staff member is on their level. So you make the recommendation like, oh, you're gonna need a pair of custom orthotics or medical grade orthotic, you need better support, proper alignment. You leave the room, the, the patient's nodding their head at you, you leave the room, the staff member comes in to cast, scan, dispense the medical grade orthotic, and the patient leans in to the staff member and said, do those really work? Is it really worth the money? What happens if your staff member doesn't have a good answer to that? Mm-hmm. They say like, well, I don't know, I guess we sell a lot of them. It's not a good answer, right? Yeah. Say, Our patients love them. I wear them every day. Everyone in the office wears them. They've been tremendously helpful. I used to have lower back pain all the time. I don't have it sold, done. Mm -hmm. No further discussion is needed because you're the doctor. You make the recommendations based on your expertise. You make the diagnosis. You state your treatment plan. It's your staff's job to close the deal because they're they're the bridge between you and the patient. That's great. That's great. Um, In terms of uh, ancillary services, continuing on, for for those that are are established, what are the, I can say mine, but I don't want to 
guide the direction. What are the, let's say the top three ancillary services? Of course, orthotics are obvious, but let's talk about more of the high tech ones because I like those. What are the three that are working the best right. for people? So and then I, DME, the top three DME then. Okay. So um, I'm going to say, I'm going to talk in terms of you're a startup practice because my, I work with a lot of startups from mm -hmm. the ground up. Perfect. And so we have to decide on um, a very small budget. You can't do everything. What they're, to, what they're going to incorporate right away, right? So obviously I'll say you need to have digital x-ray, okay? Mm -hmm. Unless they're in a hospital building, they're renting from a hospital and they're not allowed to, to do x-rays, okay? So digital x-ray is a given. But you don't need to spend $40,000 on a digital x-ray. There's mm -hmm. other, you know, other companies that it's much more cost effective. Mm -hmm. The other is um, I always recommend Shockwave first. Mm -hmm. And I have a great shockwave. It's it's RSWT, no ESWT, that has great financing options, and it's keeping a monthly lease payment to the point of affordability that you don't have the pressure of I have to sell five patients on this, or I can't even make my lease payment. Mm -hmm. With the cost and the the you know structure that I have worked out, it's less than one patient a month. It's paid for it. Everything else is cake after mm -hmm. that, and it's a highly effective treatment. It yeah. should be introduced at visit one. So it's looking at affordability initially. And then, of course, there's a million lasers out there. Mm -hmm. right? and, and I've spoken on many webinars of different types of lasers, different companies. I shouldn't say this, but I really don't care which one you get. Okay. You need to purchase or at least the one that you believe works. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, it's going to sit there like a very expensive used car. And you're going to be under that pressure every month because the lease payment on that is a lot bigger than a shockwave to sell it. Yeah. And when you're selling to patients and you're not recommending and offering, they can see that. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to become a used car salesman. So it doesn't matter to me. There's pain lasers, there's fungal nail lasers, there's lasers that treat warts and everything mm -hmm. in between. How, what do you know is going to work? What do you believe in? And if you don't believe in it and you just bought it because it's shiny and you know, the, the sales rep really, you know, won you over and sent you some chocolates. That's not a good reason to buy it. Wow. And then for DME, I would say um, there's like three basic devices that fit a multitude of issues. So you want to look at for any kind of ankle problems, whether, you know, mild, moderate, or moderate to working towards severe, some kind of a multi-ligamentous like mm -hmm. rate kind of a, a basic L1902, mm -hmm. um, L1906, but that has to have a rigid footbed. And reimbursement's not a lot higher, and it really doesn't do a lot more effectively. So that's number one. Number two, and some people disagree, but night splints. Mm -hmm. So night splints work if your patients use them. Um, you know, dorsal or posterior. I feel like the posterior work a little bit better because you can get mm -hmm. more flexion. More of a pull. Um, right, but you can use that for a multitude of conditions too. It's not just plantar fasci fasciitis. It's any kind of you know tightness in the calf, any kind of contracture. You need mm -hmm. to stretch it out, and that's a passive stretch. And people are just are inherently lazy. And if you give them a stretching sheet, and say, "Oh, you need to do this three times a day," okay. they might do it twice a day for about a day and a half. Mm -hmm. And that's it. So night splints. And then, of course, your pneumatic walkers, mm -hmm. um, which make sure that if you're dispensing a pneumatic walker, there's a reason that it's pneumatic and it, you know, pumps up with air and it compresses because there's some kind of swelling. Mm -hmm. And we all know that everyone dispenses more pneumatic than non-pneumatic because pneumatic pays more. And if you check out DME, PDAC, where it lists all the fee schedules for uh, Medicare reimbursement for these DME items, most of them for 2020 have gone way up this year, hmm. which is great, but we still need to dispense what's medically necessary and appropriate for the condition. But if you were just going to have three, those three would fit the most conditions that you treat. Perfect. Wow. Perfect. This is, this is great. And as we kind of finish up here, I really like the comment you said about what has your practice turned into? And I think you could even say that for your own life. What has your life turned into? Now let's talk to the doctors that it may have been around 5, 10, 15, 20 years. What is your life? What has your practice turned into? And how do you turn that around? 
Uh, do you have any, uh, we talked a little bit about books, about, because this is changing you. If you want to change your practice around, you can't just change your practice. You have to change you. So let's go, to, in, let's go into to Cindy coach mode head. How do doctors and who are the doctors that work with you that have been working for 15, 20 years and they want to change their practice around? Maybe they want to have the same one person practice, but they want to up everything. What are three great tips that you can change your life around, not just revenue wise, but let's say lifestyle and have just a great life? So what happens over the years, um, if you don't learn to be a, a good delegator, an effective delegator, which most of us that are functioning at a high level, um, you know, they say there's that A personality and like I have like an A plus personality. Nothing, nothing is good enough. Like no one works hard enough. No one works like me. I, that's how I think. And I, a lot of doctors have that same mentality of, I'll just do it myself. Let me do it myself. It's easier. Well, when you get busier and busier and there's more regulations, you know, thrown at you every year, compliance is harder. Documentation is harder. Everything is more difficult than it used to be. You cannot do everything yourself. So you need to figure out what is in my pay grade? What's, what's really important or worth my while to do? Mm -hmm. Because if there's no one else in your practice that when the computer freezes, compress, control, alt, delete until it resets, there's an issue. So think about everything that you had to go to podiatry school for, that you had to learn during residency. And are you doing just that or are you doing everything else? Are you playing secretary and bookkeeper and you know, maintenance guy, and are you doing everything that you should be outsourcing? Because if you're looking at the quality of your life, because physician burnout is this whole other right. topic that's very popular that I've been lecturing on for like three years now, because everyone gets to that tipping point and they either have to like slow down and come back down the hill a little bit and think, what is worth my while to do? And delegate out. And sometimes you throw money at it and you make it go away in order to keep your sanity. And that's like that American Express commercial, you know, from years ago, like that's priceless. They can't put a price tag on your sanity and your well-being. And having that balance of, you know, maybe you used to like to go running or work out every day and your practices become so out of control that you're up till midnight doing chart notes every night and you're behind on billing. And so that part of your life, that 45 minutes to an hour that you spent every day or four days a week just on yourself, you know, exercising, releasing endorphins, mm. that goes away and you can't get that back. You can't get back in the swing of things. And to me, I work out usually six days a week and I make time. I, I carve it out in my schedule. It says in my calendar for that one hour, it says Cindy busy. And my administrator can't go and she can't put a call in there. She can't schedule a meeting. And whether I'm taking a class or I'm teaching a class or whatever I'm doing, that's what keeps me balanced because mm -hmm. we all need that that yeah. stress relief so that's super important and realizing that this quality over quantity thing doctors that are seeing patients five days a week from eight to five or eight to six you know it doesn't only stay eight to five or eight to six and some of them are seeing patients half a day on saturday so if you look at that in terms of your whole life how much time are you actually spending not working it's not very much so the doctors that I've convinced, and it's taken a lot, and usually it's showing them a black and white metrics, reports month after month, year after year. What does it look like when you actually see patients less hours in a week, carve out admin time? And I don't mean go play golf time. I mean admin time where you're working on the practice rather than in it. So the whole thing with the pandemic, everybody was in a hamster wheel. And I'm too busy and I'll get to that later. And yeah, when things slow down, I always hear that from doctors. Well, when we, you know, when we're out of our busy season, when is that? Is there a time of year that people don't need to not be in foot pain? Because I, I don't think that that ever happens. So the hamster wheel slowed down enough and the brave doctors, they jumped out quick while mm -hmm. they could, while it was slow. So when it started to pick back up again, they chose to stay out of it. And that's what I'm telling people. You were brave enough to jump out. You have to stay there and you have to realize because you do now more than ever, if you don't manage the practice, if you don't have a good idea of what's going on in every aspect, you're going to lose control at some point. And there's a lot of doctors out there. They're still making money. 
but they're making money on this, this kind of grand scale of so many things are falling through the cracks that if I show them how much money they're losing, mm -hmm. in addition to the money that they're making, that would be a game changer for them because they wouldn't have to work five days a week or five and a half days a week, plus all the time they put in at home. And we ask their families, you know, how are they at home? Well, they come home, they might have dinner with us if they make it there in time, and then they're doing chart notes all night and all weekend. So that's no fun. And I've had several doctors over the years that have called me and said, I make, I'm making money. I guess it's fine. I just, my quality of life is bad. Yep. And so, you know, there's my own scope of practice has gone from kind of like this, you know, years ago to it's bigger and bigger every year because the challenges that podiatrists face and doctors face in general, it just, it, keeps getting bigger. It's like compound interest of problems. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I, I, I think, I think really that's a, a great conclusion here to, to our interview. And this really shows how you can provide value. And I, I find, you know, certain doctors might want to go to a coaching program, a mastermind, but if those, if those that are listening kind of would like to learn more about you to see if it would be a good fit, uh, how, how can they learn more about you, Cindy? Sure. So you can go on my website. It's pinnaclepa.com, like Pinnacle Practice Achievement, but that's mm -hmm. a very long website. So pinnaclepa.com. Um, what I have now is I, I do still offer one-on-one -on -one coaching. Mm -hmm. I offer practice startup programs, but I also offer what's called the practice engagement program. So mm -hmm. it's PEP because like, that's what you need. It's a little bit of PEP. And it offers you access to my entire library of resources that I've been collecting over the past 18 years that wow. I've been in this field. And so it's compliance documentation. It's some human resource stuff. There's treatment protocols. I started adding recently some staff training videos. Oh, cool. I did have staff training tools as far as lessons and quizzes and cheat sheets, but a lot of people are visual learners. And so me just talking through and showing slides has been very effective. Um, there's some sample chart notes. There's things in there like patient forms that you haven't updated in the last 15 years, updated financial policies, practice handbooks, and employee handbooks, little addendums to your handbooks like cell phone and social media policies. Yeah. Anything that I've I have ever created or helped anyone with over the years is in that library. You also get discounts from all my preferred vendors, which is a lot that you're probably already using, but paying too much. And we do frequent webinars that you are also invited to. So it's a really affordable way that you can gain access to my stuff and to me and to my resources um, really affordably. That's great, Cindy. And so I'm going to put on the bottom of the video, I'll put a, a link to that, that, that site. And for those that are interested, if you think it'll be a good fit, I, I think everyone, you have to be exposed to new information. That's why we're doing this. Uh, the problem isn't what we know. The problem is what we don't know or know that's not right or with things we don't know. So that's why we're putting this out here. So thank you so much for your time, Cindy. I appreciate it. This was a great interview. Thank you for having me. Take care.